about to begin panel two of our conference, Major Research Projects. Uh, and chairing the panel uh, will be the head of the Department of Architecture and Urban Planning at Qatar University, uh, uh, Dr. Fadl Fadli. Thank you, James. Hope you had a refreshing short break. We will carry on now with the panel two, which is major research projects. Uh, we will be dealing mainly on projects which have been conducted, delivered, or ongoing, or planned ones, and which would be hopefully part of the traditional golf architecture project and proposal. So for this, I will be calling uh, Professor Schumann Bandiupadi, the Stirling Chair and the head of the School of Architecture at University of Liverpool. He will be talking about the Center of the Study of Architecture and Cultural Heritage of India, Arabia, and the Maghreb, namely called Archia. So, uh, Shoman, please. Hi. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Shoman Bandabadhe. I'm uh, at Liverpool University, uh, head of School of Architecture, and uh, James Sterling Chair in Architecture as well. Um, this morning, uh, thank you, uh, Qatar National Library and James um, only for this fantastic opportunity of getting us together to talk about the various projects. I uh, will try to um, combine, because I've already illustrated some of the approaches that we use and with the kind of range of things that we are involved with. What I'll try to do is to take it into um, a slightly more sort of his historical understanding of how uh, this uh, the data collection actually then comes together into um, uh, major research work. Um, I was going to uh, start with uh, the RKM projects anyway, but I will um, mainly focus on some of the eight, 17th century, 18th century work uh, which uh, uh, on settlements, which uh, I think is, is going to be useful uh, for our uh, particular case, especially as we were also talking yesterday, for example, about um, the need for establishing a chronology of Gulf architecture as well. Um, as uh, what we do uh, in uh, Oman, um, I talked about a team uh, around us. We have uh, architectural historians, we have architectural technology specialists, anthropologists, archaeologists. We have uh, various architects uh, dealing with uh, that. We undertake field work. That is the kind of main way in which we work. And we also undertake ethnographic work that is talking to various um, uh, owners and ex uh, inhabitant stakeholders and so on to begin to understand the built environment. What we are uh, certainly interested in is the cultural landscape and how physical landscapes are shaped by human action, activity, performance, and how that actually then gives rise to settlements, architecture, uh, artifacts, material culture, and so on. So we uh, in terms of researching this, we look into urban structures, morphology, typology of buildings and settlement structures, social history, tribal organization, um, Islamic and pre-Islamic sociocultural ideas, which uh, are under, underpinning many of these settlements. Uh, also, at the same time, it's just not enough to look into the past, but also look into really the very important transition between the past and the present, and therefore we are interested in modern uh, environments, built environments, but also especially how vernacular envi environments have been appropriated by uh, changes in the, through a, towards modernization. We then look into conservation and development uh, uh, within historical context. What are the appropriate approaches that one can have? What are the range of options that are available, but also involving stakeholders, uh, so that we are not talking about a group making a decision about somebody else's future, but it's about a collective way of looking into how uh, decisions can be made about the value of the built environment. So we do uh, undertake those dots on the left-hand side map show the various settlements and the OSS settlements that we've been looking at. We undertake work on uh, interior uh, OSS settlements and their architecture. Uh, we undertake work on coastal settlements as well, uh, and there are some uh, on the coast 
uh, close to Muscat, but also down south in, uh, in, in the Salala region in Oman. Uh, we have also worked in the UAE, but I'm focusing mainly on uh, our work in Oman, which is more extensive. Uh, we have worked on more recently on the images show uh, the coastal settlement of Mirbat, which is an 11th, 12th century port, uh, which uh, has got still interesting remnants of uh, uh, architecture from that past. We have worked on hilltop settlements, mountain settlements, which is another type where, uh, especially in the Misfat al Abreen, but also uh, there is a, a place called Aljila in the Sharkia region, which is the dot at the bottom, where we have worked on a uh, world hated site for large system, Aljila for large system, which, uh, and the surrounding um, sort of um, pastoral uh, community, which uh, we, we looked into in some detail. Uh, we have worked on foothill settlements, which are the largest settlements, like the World Heritage Site of Bala, which is featured here, but also Nizua, uh, Mana, and uh, various other uh, settlements uh, in that region. Now, just to remind what I have said in the morning, that we do, uh, the work is essentially based on fieldwork, and the fieldwork comprises terrestrial documentation, uh, aerial photographic documentation, uh, and using ethnographic material uh, through interviews and uh, various other discussions, whether it's with a group or individuals and so on, individuals involved in various aspects of traditional life and how, uh, say for example, the water system uh, works and how land organization works and so on, as well as uh, understanding how, uh, say, uh, a, day, a cycle of a day works uh, for uh, a local community. Now, I was going to then talk about, just very briefly uh, today, about the lessons that we've learned from and how that actually shapes up our understanding, uh, historical cultural understanding of um, what I call Omani new towns, uh, because in the Omani settlements are essentially uh, pre-Islamic in many, many cases, because wherever there's been water, in most cases they've been settled in the pre-Islamic times. So they have a very long pedigree. But at the same time, uh, new initiatives have taken place at different points in time. We know that. And especially one particular moment in the Yariba period in the early 17th century, where we find there's a huge investment in land. We have a huge investment in water supply systems. And therefore, these particular settlements grow. And what I'm trying to show is how ideas of um, collaboration, ideas of exchange and partnerships actually worked there. Uh, three settlements, one is Barkat al Maz, in, uh, they are all in the, uh, in the hills. Uh, I'll just show you, uh, I don't know whether that will work. Uh, doesn't seem to point out, but it is, it is those settlements uh, right in the middle uh, where the Hajar al Garbi, the word Garbi is, and it's the settlements around that area. Uh, we have three settlements which are relevant, uh, Barkat al Maus, then Alhamra, and Misrat al Abreen, slightly up in the hills. Uh, left is Barkat al Maus, then middle is Alhamra, and the third one on the right hand side is Misrat al Abreen, a hilltop settlement. All these had resources uh, that came in because through uh, land organization, wealth dis distribution, and so on. And here I just highlight that area which you know, we are working on. Um, one particular book is quite interesting. One is, uh, this is called the Oman Culture and Diplomacy, in, published uh, by Jeremy Jones and Nicholas Ridder in 2013, uh, which, is, uh, which talks about diplomacy, the importance of di diplomacy in Omani culture, negotiation and cooperation. In fact, for the whole of the Gulf region, really. The idea of consultation, shura, and the whole notion of cosmopolitanism, which might be slightly different from the Western idea that we have, but nevertheless, it's an important consideration to have. This idea of social responsibility and, and of neighborly relationships. And at the end of the day, also unity of these different groups and so on. So what I'm trying to show through a very quick uh, uh, set of slides is how our research, which integrates actual physical work on the site, um, uh, oral uh, histories and so on, as well as historical documentation from other times and already published material, how we can begin to enhance that understanding a bit. So in the 
a Badi imamate which uh, really controlled uh, most of central Oman, we have the first imamates which goes back to about uh, middle of 8th century. Then there is a revival of that one from uh, uh, until middle of 11th century, although there is an interregnum which is a hiatus. And then the Nabahina Amirs which kind of begin to break down for 500 years, there is a Nabahina rule. And then we have again a reestablishment of the imamates in the Yariba period, uh, which is 1624 onwards till 1649 or 1640-41, really. And uh, then finally, the Al-Busaid dynasty, which is currently from 70, 60, 1749 to the present time. Um, what I will focus on mainly is starting with this Yariba Imamate. Uh, the various rulers uh, indicated here, mentioned here, mainly um, uh, Sultan, Saif, uh, Sultan bin Saif uh, the first, 1649 to 1680 is a kind of period which uh, creates this wealth. And this is also on the back of uh, the Yaribas uh, taking control of in 1649 of Muscat, and then also driving the Portuguese away from the eastern African coast, uh, also making a number of raids into uh, the Indian, western Indian coast, uh, Goa, Diu, Diu uh, Gujarati, different the uh, Gujarati ports and so on. So Diu was a Portuguese colony as well, and uh, that was that was also a, an area that was raided by the Omani uh, naval force. What is interesting is that this, all this wealth actually comes back into the society, and you suddenly find these fantastic um, sort of emergence of these really large um, uh, houses, but also large neighborhoods, haraz, which, for example, Menzafa in Ibra area, in Ibra Oasis, is really interesting, that within a very short period of time, you have these large mansions created, also fantastic um, uh, examples of this maritime culture which is embedded in them and you find sort of graffiti even to the more recent times of boats and sails and you know of uh, um, shipping across the ocean you know being s the stories being told and so on you find that in sublas in meeting halls as well lots of walls being painted with those kind of uh, images so this idea of the maritime trade and what it brought back in terms of an identity is quite crucial in many of these areas. As I was saying that uh, uh, the sacking of a number of these uh, ports along the Indian Ocean area brought in a significant amount of wealth as well. And so what we are told is also the, the Nizua Tower, the famous tower in the Nizua Fort, the Round Tower, was uh, built uh, and resourced by the sacking of Dew uh, in India, in the Western India. And so there are a number of forces, there is a number of avenues of wealth that is kind of coming through. One is the sacking of Portuguese bases, as I say. Then uh, revenue generated also from taxes on foreign traders, registration of shipping, uh, shipping in uh, Muscat, and uh, also the so-called piracy acts, which is a debatable issue uh, anyway. Centrality of diplomacy is also quite important in this, uh, because as the imams, they are not allowed to uh, hold wealth in their own name. So it is very important that this is invested in a collaborative way, and that's what the Yaribas did extremely well. What was happening was establishing collaborations at different, different OSS settlements with different groups, trying to also support these different groups at different points so that they can actually give, be given a um, um, uh, new identity as well. And so that wealth, as it comes back through the trade and various other missions, gets invested into the agricultural land. Um, just a very quick note on the, the water systems. Uh, as you, I'm sure you all know, that there are, uh, Oman relies quite heavily on the underground water system, the fallage systems. Not all are underground, but some are on surface as well. So you have different techniques of uh, appropriating the water. One on the left-hand side is the Kyle flow, which is the f from uh, uh, the surface flow within the wadi systems, and then how that is channeled off. The other ones are the natural springs, and the natural springs, of course, go up and down because depending on where um, uh, what the, the water table is. And then there is also the the, the deeper, what you call the Daudi Falaj system, which is uh, tapping into deeper aquifers and which are more reliable sources of water and they are channeled through. But also uh, the whole uh, construction system, the excavation system, then uses these 
uh, spoils to heap up around these uh, sort of uh, shafts, uh, if you like, and these are found on the right-hand side of the top. Now, the Yaribas start uh, their stronghold around a place called Rustak and then into Nakhal, and I've pointed out those two points in the sort of light blue uh, right at the top. Rusak being the kind of source where they started uh, because they were kind of local gover governor in the Rusak area under the Nabahina rulers. And so that's where they begin to wield their uh, power base. And they eventually extend out, you know, across that sort of uh, the side of the, the, the Oman Mountains uh, into Nakhal as well. Now, how, what is happening then is that as they kind of gradually gather force, they also begin to, and especially in the time of um, uh, uh, 1649 onwards till 1680, uh, what they're trying to also do is beginning to align themselves with different uh, groups, keeping in mind the kind of very innate uh, tribal uh, differences that used to exist in this. For example, then, um, there is a difference always and a distinction and a kind of animosity between the Bani Riyam, which holds control over the central Omani Mountains, and the Bani Ruwaha, who are on the other side of the mountain. So there is a kind of tension which they begin to uh, exploit. Um, and also the other one, which is about the growing uh, collection of tribes and groups called Abriin, uh, up in the hills again, and their uh, opponents, the Bani Hina. So it's a very kind of complex diplomacy that begins to uh, pull together uh, support and resources. So what we see here is that as they begin to expand their territory from Rustak to Nakhal to, to uh, the, the, what is the kind of the Sumail Pass, the main passage, they also begin to establish, they tried to establish a connection with the Bani Ruwaha, didn't work out quite well. So they kind of extend their, the, if you follow the blue route down, that is a passage that Nasir bin Murshid, the first ruler, and then Sultan bin Saif uh, also make at that point. And right up to, uh, by the time where they reach Samad in the eastern area, they've actually conquered a lot of property. What therefore that indicates to the Bani Riyam is that Bani Riyam should actually go and actually contact them and connect, establish a relationship, which they do. And therefore starts off a kind of really interesting relationship of, uh, settlement building you know, in this area. The same thing, a slightly different thing happens with Abriin. Abriin essentially are kind of a group of uh, various groups of small tribes who are uh, in a disparate state. But they sometimes earlier in the 15th century, 16th century, they begin to move into the hill area and under the Yariba um, the patronage, begin to coalesce into one group. So essentially, there is a difference between how Bani Riyam is composed and Bani, um, the Abriin are composed. So what that does is that in establishing this relationship with the Abriin and the Bani Riyam, the headwaters are then beginning to get controlled. So if you look into these arrowed lines, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, those, those points, that point, sorry. Uh, and uh, one further down, they're essentially about the, the headwaters, controlling the headwaters. Those settlements that the Yaribas establish in collaboration with the Abriin and the Bani Riyam are actually positioned in such a way to control the headwaters. Therefore, to control whatever happens uh, downstream, because that's where the kind of key sources of water are coming from. So, in controlling that, then they ensure a control over the larger settlements like the Bahala, Nizwa, and so on, which are at the foothills. They can be controlled by proxy, if you like. And that's what exactly they do over this period. Here in Alhambra, they, uh, this is the Abriin settlement where they pull together and encouraging the Abriin to come together. They pull together a large settlement, which partly uses its own flood system, but also uses the, uh, the surface water in this huge wadi, which is uh, on the, on the left-hand side. And in Barkat al what is happening? So one is the Abriin as well as the, uh, the Riyam, Bani Riyam, are given options to start with choosing their settlements. And the Abriin go for this particular settlement in Alhambra, but also because of the proximity of the higher reach, like Misfat al and others, which are at a higher level, where they can actually have established a kind of larger, 
what he called a tribal dir, a capital and a center of influence. So it is a new town which comes up in this area where the whole of the low land is given out to agricultural land. You can see this huge triangular shaped, fan shaped area that is coming out. On the right hand side on the ridge is the settlement that uh, they construct in a very densely packed settlement, quite a significant one. Slightly different approaches happening in uh, Barakat al Maz, where uh, we have sort of very interesting creation myths and stories about uh, when Sultan uh, bin Saif the first um, uh, wants to establish this relationship with the uh, the Bani Riyam. So it says during the excavation through the wadi, a collapse in the Kanat gallery resulted in seven deaths, and the workers abandoned the excavation and fled back to Jabal al -Aghdar. Now the Imam then uh, followed them to a place between Kariyat al muidin and al Qasud, and uh, the seeds of Siddhar in his hands, which he spread while calling them. They agreed to continue excavating the Falaj under the condition of having a share in it, and the Imam agreed to give them one share while retaining two shares for himself. So what it tells us is a kind of story where a number of issues are taking place. One is that the Bani Riyams uh, Falaj excavation skills, which then contrast some of the ideas that were being pushed forward by Wilkinson at an earlier stage, where he said that this was an essentially a Persian import, and therefore it was um, uh, a kind of they didn't the Omanis didn't have the skills and so on. Now, uh, the other thing is that the Imams need uh, he had to keep the Baniriam on his side, and that was an important thing, a geopolitical decision that he had to make. Also, the imam's willingness to cede ground, again, an issue of accommodating others, accommodating uh, collaboration, and the Falaj being the source and the metaphor for diplomacy, because the Falaj essentially then, in this whole story, stands uh, uh, as a metaphor for diplomacy in this case. So we see this sort of tripartite division of the Barakat al Maud's Falaj, therefore two parts going to the upper side and then one part going to the lower end, and that's where you find the sort of three divisions taking place at the source, where the source comes down and then begin, begins to bifurcate. We have the source then, this is, this is after, this is after the, the Yariba um, sort of uh, fortified dwelling, the Beit al Rudeida. Rudeida um, fort is actually, you can see the line just before that, uh, if I can point out. This is the Beit al, uh, this is the Falaj, Khatamin going in. So it has just surfaced from underground, is going in. And notice what is important here is that it's actually going through a private property, which is not normally the case. So the, the Yariba Imamate is making sure that it is controlling the water while it is also allowing the water to be shared. So then the water goes out, and that's where this sharing mechanism takes place, after the Sharia. So the main water source is, uh, Sharia is here, that's where the fresh water is collected, just next to this uh, mosque, and then the water bifurcates. What we then have is these three channels, as we can see. Two of the upper channels actually uh, are the uh, originally the Yareba Imamate uh, shares, and the other one, which is again resulting in extensions farther down to the oasis, which is on the southern side and branching off. It creates uh, really very extensive uh, uh, waterworks, aqueducts, and so on. We can see this really, uh, really quite a prominent aqueduct crossing the the, uh, the oasis, as you can see on the map here, where we have this piece of the aqueduct directing here. So we have a settlement which then eventually grows around that. Sebani is probably the oldest settlement, Harata Sebani, which is at the top end there, which is on the mountain, and then there are other settlements come up. Certainly the Souk was not a settlement which uh, had existed before, but it only came up as a consolidation of a market area. But the rest of the settlements gradually grew around it. Uh, Harata Sebani also has some fantastic fossil collections around this area. Uh, any, pretty much any stone you have done, you know, there's uh, fantastical fossil uh, remains there. Uh, Harata Sabani here on the aerial photograph, you can see how the, 
the water systems actually go through that. You can see also that the earlier foliage was pro the upper one, and then the later one actually was extended through the settlement or incorporated into the settlement wall at a later time. You can also see some of the key sublas or the meeting halls, which are indicated there, as well as the washing areas and ch changing systems and everything else along that top, uh, along this top foliage uh, channel. And so therefore, most of the social space is surrounded concentrated around the flood system. So you have the sublas, the bathing areas, the changing ones, the mill and everything else, uh, the flour mill that is, and everything else around that, uh, that uh, passage. Now, if we look into the tribal groupings, again, slightly different from the Abrein, but what it is is that it's a confederation of a number of groups which come together. But they are much more cohesive as the Baniriam tribe, and therefore there is a degree of social openness, you know, within that, uh, because therefore we are not talking about, say, areas like Mana and so on, where you have a whole range of different groups uh, residing in the same place. What it does, therefore, is that it allows savlas, uh, meeting halls, to be attached to private houses, you know, which is not normally the practice in elsewhere. Uh, here the sablas are, because of the, the close relationship between the various groups, it begins to become attached. In this case, for example, on the right-hand side, you have a double-storied sabla, which has got a flour mill at the bottom. The staircase on the outside gives access to the sabla, which is partly for the house, but also partly for the wider community. Yeah. Also this one, on the left-hand side, you find that the, as you go up, this set of steps and then the sabla is on the right hand side at the back end, which is essentially part of the house, but it is an integral part of it. On the right, on the left hand side, it's, it's an interesting story. The bit in the front, on the left hand side image, bit in the front right hand side, is actually the remnants of the RAF rocketed um, uh, remains of uh, Barkhaz Lumwaz, which is really what happened following the Jabal War um, in, in, in the late 1950s. So we have half of the house that is there on the right hand side sort of demolished completely. So then going back to, um, I will just very quickly move to the next point and I'll finish there. Um, this idea of tribal cohesion, collaboration, uh, diplomacy with the tribe has been a kind of big feature of how settlements have uh, been created and how resources have been pulled together. Um, we find that again in that this is a kind of very quick map of tribal movements around the late 17th century into the early 18th century where we find uh, say the al Busaid tribe, the present uh, ruling family kind of moving from their center in Adam, but also pulling together with them a number of other tribes, say for example the Falajdigas, our mayor uh, Falajdigas who had skills like the Bani Riam had skills in Falaj digging, that they are actually uh, pulling them together. So they move into Mana, for example. Uh, Mana, these are recent photographs. And what they do there is also in Mana, they start changing the settlement structure a bit. If I can focus on it on the left hand side on the map, the red, the orange ones are actually the Albusaid groups. But because they're aligned with the Manaders, Mandaris, uh, the Mandaris. Uh, were connected to the Yaribas previously, but as the Yariba power went down, they start to actually realign with the uh, Albasaid. They get into Mana and they settle within agricultural land. So the issue of how much agricultural land is extended and given out is sort of very interestingly evidenced here because the original line may have been sort of somewhere here from going from here to there, and then the Mandaris came in here, and that necessitated the extension of the, the, uh, the agricultural land, that also necessitated the, uh, the establishment of a well over here. So gradual changes in this one is about a kind of complex negotiation and of uh, alliances that we have here. So as they move towards Muscat from Adam, gradually, we find the gradual story of moving there. Yet, at the same time, when they move to Muscat and establish a kind of base uh, close to Muscat in Boucher, in Fath al Busaid, they bring with them these Falajdigas, the Awamirs, who are kind of close relations. So we have in Fath al Busaid 
a really interesting example of a small uh, miniature oasis in the making where we have the f f army Falaj diggers settling down with them and creating the Falajas for them in the 18th century. And you have this sort of little uh, beautiful sort of uh, uh, small little um, fortlet, which is the Fat al Busaid, and the, uh, the garden around that. But also, also, what is interesting is that as they move through this route, as I was sh showing you here, in every place there are houses that are being created the Al Busaid. And what they also do is continue a tradition of uh, uh, craftsmanship with them. So there are craftsmen moving as well at the same time. So if you look into these supports for the beams on the top there, they're found in Mana, they're found in Nizwa, they're found in Barakat al they're found in uh, Fath al -Busaid. So not only that they're looking at the biggest structure of how settlements should be organized politically, but also they are actually taking craftsmen with them to emulate perhaps the Yariba uh, sort of legacy, if you like. And uh, so, that's where I'll end. What I, um, just to sum up very quickly, is that it's crucial to understand uh, settlements and oasis settlements that, and uh, settlements along the coast, that what kind of alliances um, uh, were established, what kind of political advantages were taken from it, and how resources were deployed in terms of water and land holdings, which is quite crucial. And in studying, therefore, the very important part of bringing to the, the physical, the physical architecture is only the tip of the iceberg. You know, it only tells a little bit of the story. It's not enough at all. But it's only when we begin to piece together oral histories to histories of different sorts, panegyrics and so on, we begin to make a story, uh, a more reliable story of settlements in, in, the, uh, in the Gulf area. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating uh, journey through Omani architecture. Uh, we will have our next speaker, and then we will open the discussion at the end of the panel. So our next speaker is Professor Nader Adelan, and he will be talking and presenting on the work which has been done on uh, sustainable golf urbanism. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been asked to give a little bit of introduction as to who I am. I was born in uh, Tehran, and at the age of seven, my father, who was educated at the London School of Economics, was asked as treasurer of Iran to go to America to help negotiate the Marshall Plan loans to Iran. So my father, my mother, my sister, we went to Washington, D.C. And essentially, I grew up in America, and for about 18 years, I went through Carnegie Mellon, through Harvard, through SOM, and built my life as an American architect. At some point in 1964, there was a great yearning deep within me as to who are you, Nader? And the same with my wife, who was also of a similar background as myself. And around that time, uh, there was also a reaching out by the oil company of Iran uh, for people who had been trained to come and replace uh, many of the English technicians who were running the oil company in the fields of uh, Khuzestan in South Iran. And so really that's how I began my life in this part of the world again. And of course, uh, as a oil company, the, the architect of the oil company, my life was in a place called Masjid Suleiman. And I distinctly recall that my experience with uh, the Gulf, uh, and you know, of course, we go through many descriptions of names, and we agreed, uh, even in the Mesherab research we did, that we would say these following words. Uh, Iranians have called the Gulf the Persian Gulf. Recently, uh, the Arabian uh, world has called it the Arabian Gulf. And in our research to uh, Basra, uh, the Iraqis told me, you must use the Gulf of Basra. So we all agreed that we would call it the Gulf and the Khalij. And so I'm very happy to speak on the topic of Khalij architecture. 
And my first experience in the Khalij architecture was that I built uh, workers' housing for the uh, oil company on a little island, very beautiful island called Harg Island in 1964. And, and Harg Island was idyllic. I came, I swam in this beautiful fertile water. I spearfished uh, mahi tuti, the, uh, what is called the parrot fish, and grilled it on the coast. And that was my experience with the Gulf. So I've been involved with the Gulf for a bit of time. Jumping forward, I spent 12 years from 1994 to 2006 uh, in Kuwait. I directed the design of a firm that grew to be 2,000 people with uh, multiple offices all around the world and uh, very wonderful activity here in Qatar. So, through this activity, I became very much engaged with the fact that I was deeply moved by what I saw as the traditional architecture of this region. And uh, then, very moved in a negative way as to how we were then building in these lands. And so I began a series of researches, and the first one, uh, His Highness Sheikh Nahyan, the Minister of Higher Education of uh, UAE, was kind enough to allow me to study through with the AA, with Simos Janos, who was helping in the study of sustainable architecture. And we carried out our work uh, with also the American University in Sharjah. And my work uh, resulted in publications of sustainability aspects in the UAE. This led to uh, another work. And I'm going to give you a framework of this presentation because you, ha you have to sort of go through the path to understand why so many years of concentration. I found that essentially uh, my life was being committed to studying the Tropic of Cancer, which is, you know, around 23 uh, latitude. And looking at that tropic, in the lifetime since I came to this area, I now am living on the other side, uh, on the Gulf of Mexico, same latitude, same tropic of cancer. And my studies that I'll show you today are what I've learned about what uh, this area has built, what perhaps some of the present conditions uh, that challenge us here are and what we might have to be thinking of doing. So today I'm not only going to speak to you about the very major research work we did at Harvard, but also please try to bring you into uh, awakening of some of the really major issues facing us, which is not just architecture, but is climate change. So as you know, uh, the world really can be broken down into eight bioclimatic zones. I worked for five years with a fantastic ecologist, Ian McHarg, from University of Pennsylvania, doing a project in Iran called Pardisan. Uh, Ian, uh, good Scotsman that he is, taught me a lot about how to deal with uh, ecological studies that also was more holistic and also involved human habitation. So we have on one side where we are now, uh, the Gulf, and then just right on across, we have the Gulf of Mexico. I'm gonna share with you the fact that these researchers over these many years have really dealt with hot, humid, hot, arid, bioclimatic cultural zones of the world. After the work we did for His Highness Sheikh Nahyan, 
we got a wonderful commission from Kuwait Fund at Harvard uh, Kennedy School, and we did a study with the noted anthropologist, Dr. Stephen Caton, who is a Yemeni poet expert and on Arab culture, and myself, and our aim in this study, he to understand cultural identity, I to understand sustainability, and we did the work on essentially uh, the work in the Gulf, but we focused it on Kuwait, uh, UAE, and Qatar. And we did this through a series of studies that studied also the ecology of this area. As you very well know, these lovely diagrams, and you know those r brilliant white spots in the middle of that black Khalij are about 360 oil wells. And these oil wells by themselves spill about two million gallons of oil into the beautiful or formerly beautiful Gulf. And of course, they destroy all this seabed. They destroy the seagrass, the mangroves, the coral, and the life that exists beneath the water that we don't see. We'll also talk about a lot of things that are beneath the surface that we don't see. We call it the intangible. We've studied certainly the wonderful forms of uh, Kuwait in 1950, as you see it from the aerial. We also look at uh, UAE, at the palms, and the developments and the destruction that the palms have brought upon the natural ecological base of that zone. We studied very much also the traditions of people. And then we also found this incredible movement of nature. This movement of nature also has to do with the movement that clouds the mind of human beings. And so out of these clouds come this new reality. This is the new reality of our zone totally unsustainable, totally culturally irrelevant, but at the same time, a great opportunity. And this is the paradox in which we live today. I want to just quickly say about this paradox. On the left, we have the amount of energy that a traditional sustainable dwelling unit needs. Yeah, it's about 25 kilowatts per square meter per year. On the extreme right is more or less what most of the buildings that we're doing and the communities that we're building are about 10 times that and much higher. So at 250 kilowatts per square meter per year. And at some point when we wise up and we find out what we should be doing, we'll probably get to that middle one called mixed, some ME assisted, but the rest, because for God's sake, at least three months out of the year is pleasant. You can open a window. And in between those uh, summer months and fall, etc., there are also a few months where we could adapt to nature naturally. So you might be looking at a future that might live at 50, 60 kilowatts per hour per year. I want to also speak with you because we had a, you have here a terrific resource. And I hope that this illustrious group at Qatar National Library takes advantage of working with a place called ROPME, R-O-P-M-E, the Regional Organization for the Protection of the Marine Environment. All of the eight countries of the Gulf have signed since 1976 onto the treaty that this organization uh, was brought into being by UNDP. They keep track of the health of our society, of, of our water society. So first of all, they document that we have a population that has grown from a total of around the region of a million and soon into 20 million. And this cultural change, unseasonable urbanism, air and land pollution has been a result of that change. Many good things have also come about, 
But these are the dangers, these are the vulnerabilities that have come about. Alteration and destruction of habitats and loss of biodiversity. Just think of the great grasslands of southern Tigris Euphrates that has been lost during the war. Industrialization, desalinization of water and material waste that are dumped directly into the marine. Accidental and operational oil spills. I mentioned to you this issue of at least two million barrels a year. Ballast, bio-invasion, fish kills, public health hazard. Because when these large ships come, they come loaded with water from another region as ballast. They empty it into the sea and then take on oil or whatever. And so we have invasions of unbelievable places from the world onto this lovely little piece of water. And then, of course, we have a history of military strife, economic boom and bust. And economic boom and bust really is sort of a pattern. It is also a pattern we've inherited because we have become more or less capitalist nations. And that is a characteristic. You build, you destroy, you throw away, and you bust, and then you build again. This is how we live. This is the economic pattern of how we live. Get used to it. It isn't all good news. It is this way. And then there is global warming. There's the highest carbon electrical footprint here in the world, in Qatar, in Kuwait, in Dubai. Highest carbon footprint. I also want to bring your attention to the environmental crisis that Ropemi anticipates, and I'll go much more into it because this took me into the field in which I spend my time now. There'll be probably at least around 50 centimeters of sea rise by 2050, if we're lucky. This doesn't account for the melting of the Antarctic and the Arctic glaciers and sea ice. So rope me, UNDP says to us, major pressures are transforming the environment, culture, economy, and urbanism in the region, leading to unsustainable scenarios. I don't want to be alarmist. I'm just sharing with you what I've learned. But this is stuff I learned in 2010. This is the stuff, and I'll show you one more thing, because we also found this with relation to our beautiful Qatar. Look at that. Strongest areas of Shomal winds are on the north peninsula of Qatar. These bring about the cyclone, such as the cyclone that happened in 2009 Gunu. Don't think that these things don't happen. Please keep an eye on that twirling mass of moisture, because I'm going to come back to that more or less to the end of my talk. So because of these dangers, because of these warning signs, Gulf sustainable urbanism came into being. We brought these kinds of studies to Qatar, and really, I must say, it was presented to Her Highness Sheikha Moza, who directed us to Meshereb and to Isa al muhannadi who became a champion of putting this work into a framework and signing a contract in 2011 with Harvard Graduate School of Design and a multiple group of other uh, faculties at Harvard. And we began this work towards a sustainable urbanism in the Gulf analysis of the past. I want to say that this was a three-part study, and it addressed eight countries that come from Oman all the way up to uh, Iraq. And at the beginning, it accounted for our investigating sustainable urbanism in a holistic manner from Muscat to Dubai to Abu Dhabi to Doha to Bahrain to Dammam to Kuwait to Basra to Bandar Lenghi and Bandar Abbas. I would have done also Boucher, 
except that there is a atomic uh, plant there. And it was very difficult to get permission to do the type of studies that we do there. Whereas Boucher uh, and Bandar Abbas and Bandar Lenge were more open. And Bandar Lenge, I bring to your attention that really until around 1903, 1905, was the major port of export from this Gulf. Until these moved to Dubai through movements that I believe were orchestrated by Great Britain because they wanted to collect the duties that would come through the trade in this area. And so Dubai became a center of great activity. And at the same time, you have places that then grew up in Dubai called Bastakia. What was Bastakia? Bastakia is the baby of Bastak, which is one of the major ports and centers of activity to the north of Bandar Lenge. So I want to just say that one of the first things you learn about studying the history of this area is that all of these cities were cosmopolitan in terms of people moving from one place to the other by trade, by season. This gulf was a totally interdependent, totally flexible place of trade and culture and movement. From Abu Dhabi and the hills of Dilmon would come copper that would be shipped to Basra and you would develop trade between Basra and the south. And so movement north, east, west, very fluid. It was the way this place survived for the 5,000 years that we know of it. And I'm sure that in the future 5,000 years, we will go back to again being interdependent. And all the minor things that come about politically are little ties and ripples, but we're one integrated maritime system. So this study was based on defining sustainability of built environments as relevant uh, to the study context. And it began with phase one. We had proposed a three-part three work. The past would really be looking at adaptation to context. And you see the words, I, we, we thought and we still believe that it was really survival that drove how we built in the past. And it gave a sustainable life pattern, a climate comfort to the level that we could achieve. And it had an improvement of quality of life by these measures. It had a stability. And it was based on pearl diving, fish, coral, sand, oil, and local resources. And essentially, it was a natural marine time economy. We have not had the chance to do phase two or phase three. But this is certainly a diagram that I hope that this Qatar National Library takes on as its challenge. If it only studies the past and documents the buildings as it was, which is very important, which we did a lot of it, and I hope it continues, you have to find the lessons of what you do to solve the problems of the present and then vision, the visions for your future. Because it is not the visions of what we're building. You're not building visions. You're copying the West. You're copying building styles. You're copying unsustainable lifestyles. And I will say to you, when we did the first work which related to the aspect of a new Arab urbanism with Dr. Caton, it was all based on oral surveys, on focus groups, and we met with people in all of these cities. Every one of the groups essentially saw that we had three generations that we were dealing with. We were dealing with the grandfathers, and when we asked them what they thought about the life that they saw and the built environment, they said, we're living in a virtual world. This world for us is a virtual world grandfathers. Then we talk to the fathers. The fathers are the persons who really moved into this world. They felt great pride, just like my father felt great pride in bringing Iran in the 40s, 50s, 60s into the world of what we would call 20th century. Our fathers moved us into here. 
And I want to say the other day, I ran into one of these fathers at Qatar, that uh, Rogai Abu Sharaf took me there. And I asked this by accident, I asked this father this question. He said, you know, I felt so moved that I started a school to teach philosophy to children, and perhaps you know this gentleman, this idea that we need to be developing a philosophy very early in our children so they're not suddenly misled into another world. And then, of course, I want to say we had interviews with students, with young people. The young people, of course, loved the fact that they had the opportunity they could fly anywhere in the world, live any life, but at the same time, we found that there was an identity crisis. And this identity crisis is really the major element because most of our population are young. And I ask you, what is the identity that we're giving to them for your future? So this study, broken down into essentially three themes urban form and architecture, environment and public health. And I want to say this is very important because one of the greatest movements as climate change occurs will be increased public health hazards. And we had the Harvard Medical School, Dr. John uh, Spangler, who came with us and his team. So a very you know, informed group of people helped in that field and then there was the socio-cultural and economic. And I want to say that I'm so happy that today, hearing from uh, Schumann, the aspect of culture, you know, most aspects of studies leave culture alone. They say, oh, we're going to study sociology. But sociology is not culture. So the study essentially was to divide the eight countries and look at them with these three aspects, and then to look at volume one of the past. And this is what I'm going to briefly present to you now. Uh, wonderful, wonderful faces. Uh, I don't know, is Ibrahim still here? No, well, there you find. Always a champion, always first in line to say, what can I do? And then as we sort of move through, you may recognize some of the other. There is Ragaya Abu Sharaf uh, in seated who helped with the anthropological studies. There the man in white, uh, Esau, Mohan Nadi, uh, Spiro, uh, my co-worker uh, with the study. Uh, man in white, uh, Mushari Al-Naim, uh, Go to him in Saudi Arabia. He's working with Sheikh Sultan right now on the same sort of things for Saudi Arabia. Next to him is Bukhash. Fantastic. Dubai. All the information in the back from Iran. Uh, and then moving to the right. And th there's that uh, lady who helped us with Musharraf. And I'm on the right. We moved to each city, we met extensively, and people actually told us what was dear to them. This man, uh, Mr. Nisif, uh, wanted very much that the door, his old door, would be saved in the new buildings that might be built, which we did with him. So this is volume one, the past, and I hope, uh, hopefully I wrote now in publication and we're still waiting for this to be resolved, but this is a brief partial presentation of that work. Organized in four scales from region, town, neighborhood, unit. And so I'll quickly, just to get a sense of the region. So we documented, you know, what the topography of the work of the uh, Gulf is, and as you know, this Gulf it's a little bit of water that moves into it and it moves counterclockwise. One particle of water takes three years to come into the Gulf and to go out. So very slow moving. It means that all the pollution and everything, and there's really two levels of major pollution. 
The Tigris Euphrates brings everything that goes from up from Turkey down to Iraq, etc., accumulates it and dumps it without any filtering. Now that the great grasslands of southern Iraq have been destroyed. Okay? And then the aspect of the other thing that is really very important is this diagram here that shows a profile of the east coast and the west coast. And you see the enormous flat lands. I was mentioning yesterday the average of the coastal flat is 35 centimeters for one kilometer. That is, it rises only 35 centimeters over one kilometer. So it means enormous amount of stress with even one meter rise of water onto the whole of this flat land. You're in greatest danger. Iran, because it has mainly its highlands, and Oman, because it has mainly its highlands, really fear less. But all the other six countries are very much susceptible to sea rise. And we did a lot of the studies, you know, what is the aquifer that feeds Qatar? You know, it comes from Najd as it builds up and then it comes up, fortunately, bubbling in Doha. The same similar bubbles up in Bahrain. These are things we have to protect. These are things that are natural movements that keep our life going. And then, you know, you saw, I don't want to, you know, those, we studied the entire effect of the seasons, the history of movement between this region and the world. And I want to bring your attention, please, please do your studies back to 2500 BC. This is Ur. This is a courthouse documented by Woolley in his uh, researches on uh, the wonderful settlement, Mesopotamian settlement of Ur. <laughs> Do you recognize this plan? Do you recognize this courtyard? We've been building courtyards for 5,000 years. How is it possible that today what we build is towers and we don't build space around which we could live and which we could have privacy? Don't fall. And of course, you know, the study ch checked the economics of, for instance, Kuwait maritime trade. What was it like? Where did it deal? What was Qatar like? What was it dealing with? And this is very important. What was the transition from past to present? How do we define the past? And so we did diagrams, and this one just shows you that diagrammatic from our research. We propose that really some of the first societies were like Bahrain and Kuwait that moved into the, what I would call the 20th century, and some of the other uh, countries, such as Doha or the southern portions of Iran, a bunch later. Well, how did we do it? Well, there's a deep analysis about oil prices, because it's the economy that drives these things. Production of oil, uh, revenue per capita, the size of populations. So in Kuwait, we thought that it was really after 1948, and that zone was for about uh, 10, 12 years. And for Doha, it moves a little bit later. It's somewhere in the 50s and 60s. This can be debated, but these are the uh, analytical basis of how these studies about past and present were made. The study essentially did a lot of comparisons between the size and growth of cities. And of course, you know, Kuwait in the past was the largest of the cities in the Gulf. It was uh, the most sort of prosperous. And then you see the diagrams of the various cities as they have grown over time. And of course, each city was studied in great detail. I'm just giving you the summary. So at a town scale, uh, Kuwait in 1950, and then studies of hydrology, fresh water supply, what, what allowed Kuwait to be Kuwait ecologically? 
And then how did it grow from the first rings from 1756 all the way up uh, to the 1950s? And then, of course, you know, with turning on the tap in 1948, Kuwait boomed. The city got a new master plan. The plan was tear down this city, build outside the city. And you know, for years, downtown Kuwait looked like a ruin. I, I came to Kuwait in those periods. Of course, now it's getting built up. But then that immediately shattered the close-knit patterns of living. And so you had these quarters outside of the city. And then people had to migrate uh, and transform themselves to the city for work and then transport themselves out to the suburbs for life. It didn't need to be that way. Wait in 1950. Documentation was very much in detail. Similar to all the cities. These are all the mosques that were documented in the traditional city. Those were how the quarters grew. That's essentially the schools that had existed. And as you know, Kuwait was very advanced in the schools. Many people educated in Kuwait because they sort of received the first schools. Her Hanis Sheikh Hamouza studied in Kuwait for her education first. And then what was the life pattern? These were merchants. These were great seagoing. So what was at the edge of the city? The edge of the city was really made of warehouses and diwanias, and of course, uh, the place of customs control. Who were they? What were they? What did they look like? These were all documented. And then from the coast, you moved into the bazaar, and so the bazaar uh, is documented, and its growth. And then neighborhoods. We took sample neighborhoods. We did a lot of study on the size of the neighborhood, number of population, the density. Also, in the sustainability, you'll notice that the red represents greatest heat in the courtyard, and the blue, the greatest coolness. This is very important. We did many, many studies with regards to the impact of sustainability, with regards to the size of courtyards that varied between certain parts of the Gulf and others. What were the patterns of this life? The idea of the sika, the idea of the bench, the saku, the sabbat. And you know, uh, this morning, uh, Abraham was kind enough to refer to some of these studies that really showed what was the temperature that was outside, what was inside, by the adaptive forms of the street patterns and the shading, and also the type of courtyards. And then we come to the courtyard. In each city, we picked essentially five, because we had to do 10, actually it grew to 13 cities. So in the period of 18 months, what we did was pick about five, we would call representative courtyards. And we did an enormous amount of analytics, daylight analysis. What the red is direct sun, blue, no sun, how does sun penetrate? And then what were the uses of these rooms? And then what were the elements of the courtyard uh, house? So there was the room, there was the corridor, there was the majlis, and those you sort of see as pattern usage. And we did this for every city. We studied the places of worship. And then we did comparative analysis. So Kuwait City uh, courtyard houses, uh, Muharraq, Doha, Dubai, Bandar Lenge. The more south we came, the greater the humidity, particularly in Bandar Lenge, the larger the size of courtyards. Uh, and the more the use of badgirs and a uh, whole story really with regards to the question that was asked, did Badgirs belong here in Doha? Of how the migration of Badgir from really Bandar Lenge to Bahrain to uh, Doha occur. 
uh, those, uh, that other study, I encourage you, were privacy studies. So when you came in the door, door what did you see? So the beginning, uh, this is in a house in Bandar Lenge, you really didn't see anything, okay? The front rooms, which were the uh, Biruni, the Majlis area, prevented you from seeing the Andaruni, the uh, private place. And then, of course, later on, when you're into the private area, you had that level of privacy. What were some of the distances to mosques? It's interesting that the average in the Gulf is about 140 meters or three minutes walk in a neighborhood to a mosque. And you can see it varied between various city. Uh, Bahrain had the highest amount. You had about 56 meter, one minute walk. Also, the transformation of the traditional courtyard house. This is a study that Mashari al Naim did. Uh, the, the study of what is a first generation house, larger spaces as it moves into the second generation. And the movie showed us that the, the, in the movie that was shown by your university, that the, uh, the, he built for his father, he built for his uncle. You know, this is how the courtyard house gives flexibility to adapt to life rather than shunting grandfather out to a warehouse. We kept our family together. And what was the life pattern during the day? So we tracked the greatest heat, the uh, coolness, high, highest activity. Uh, during the great peak, lowest activity, you came home, you rested, and then the activity. And then in each house, you could move around the house because of how the sun moved. So during the day, you use one portion because it was cooler, and then in the afternoon, you use another one which was cooler. And of course, the study of climate mitigation systems. I'm just showing you the first sample, but we're very much into that area. And then, of course, the whole idea of sustainable use of construction materials where did materials come from? How were they used? And that really would lead you to that whole aspect of the trade with Zanzibar and India with regards to the trade of wood and other trades. Out of this, what sustained the built habitat of our Gulf was this, was the courtyard house that gold, the gold in the center of your heart, that's the positive space. The other stuff was just there. It might be on one side, it might grow to two sides, it might grow to four sides. It's the space. We built space, we didn't build objects. And why? Because there is a sense of cultural identity called Baten Zahir. Our inner, we protect our inner. Our inner is our gold. There is the spirit within you, and your body is your jess, and you move through your soul. And then in this outer, this is your body. That is the encompassing arms of whatever the unknown order, and your soul moves out to that. This idea of Baten Zahir, throughout all of the area we have believed, and you build that way but not anymore, why not? So what are some of the highlights of what we might have learned? And these are just highlights. The analysis of what we learned was many, many, many pages, just for fun. Interdependency and self-sufficiency, very characteristic of the Gulf area because of what we mentioned about the movement of trade and activity of a maritime society that was integrated with one another. Climatic adaptability, cultural relevance, privacy, compactness, density, courtyard housing, proximity, inclusion, flexibility, 
high level of inclusion of male and female for their tasks and at times of activity. And this issue of proximity, the whole idea of proximity patterns. We, we can't walk to our neighbor anymore. We can't walk to our souk anymore. And flexibility. In the building of cities, it's very interesting if you study the pattern of how urban life was controlled and the flexibility, but yet the order that existed. And local materials, craftsmen, and deeply important symbolism. Symbolism is our cultural sign built in architecture. And the result, in many ways, was a transcendent, timeless existence. Transcendence. How do you develop transcendence in your built environment? I think we've lost that art. <laughs> Forgive my sermonizing. I, I, I can't get away from it. The last part I want to show to you is that we proposed a knowledge platform to put everything that we had done on a GIS system. I know that I hope you're thinking about doing something like that. I hope that you would take this work that was done at Harvard as one of these layers, and you build on these as layers. OK, I'm going to end with what I've learned by now going to another coast, another gulf. When I moved to southwest Florida three years ago, I knew that my fellow colleagues at Harvard were already doing a work on sea rise in Miami Beach, by a contract with the mayor of Miami Beach. And I asked that we could develop a collaborative effort with Florida universities to do the same for Southwest Florida. This is 216 to now. This is the Gulf of Mexico. I happen to live in that red dot on the side called Naples. And that's where we first began this work. My hope truly would be, if ever possible, that this entire gulf would be studied similar to our gulf here. Because these regional centers need work on a regional basis. So you see in red on the bottom that those areas are susceptible to total inundation with two meter of water rise. I live there. And in September 10, 2017, you remember that? whirlwind that you saw, this hit us and went directly over our house. This was a level five hurricane. You will go through cyclones here. The more warmer our water gets, the more water is retained in the atmosphere. The more water in the atmosphere, the greater these hurricanes, the greater the rainfall. And we took the work we did at Miami Beach, we proposed it for, uh, and the work we've done here in many ways, and we proposed it through use of the Center for Environment, the Chan School of Public Health and Business School, Law School, Kennedy School, and around this area, whatever we've also been doing on very quantitative things like rental housing analysis, and also the whole study of the similar idea for the Caribbean. And we propose that in union with Gulf Coast University, a new university, and Florida University, their sort of mother university, whose specialty is marine science and others, that we would do this study for this little area of Florida. Our university people were much wiser than we. They proposed a grant to BP, British Petroleum, and got a million dollars in 2017. And what they've started, which is the way it should be, they should go first, they're doing a web-based interactive tool for coastal resiliency and eco-restoration. But what does that all mean? They're studying when will sea rise occur, 
at what level between now and the end of the century. They're now in their six months of study. And we propose that together we would study sea rise, surge, because those are the principal areas, and saltwater intrusion. All of these things I'm saying re relate to you here. You should study the impact on your infrastructure. How will your roads occur? How will you get surface drainage? Everything we drain is by nature to the water. What if the water rises a meat and everything backs up? Land use. How are you going to protect your future by proper land use and not build in areas that are deeply susceptible to flooding? What are we doing to the ecology? May I say one of the greatest supports is nature. Your mangroves, protect your mangroves. They're the ones that are the first level that protect the land. And then to our beaches, to recreation. What draws tourists to these areas? And we wanted to do it at a regional scale, at a county scale, and at a municipal scale. And we propose essentially a two and a half year study with participation of local academics, publics, and private shareholders. Just show you, here is sea level projection, 2050, there is Naples, and you can say, gee, it's only half a foot to 1.3 feet. These are the conservative estimates that these places are using now, not to scare people. I'll say to you that this number, by the end of the century, at a conservative level, will grow to one and a half to 4.6 feet. You're already looking at 1.5 meter. Please don't forget these studies based on IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the UN, only are recording sea rise by growth of temperature because of methane and CO2 emission. They're not accounting for ice melts by the Antarctic. I'll go to that as I close. These are what happens when these storms hit. They occur and go so far deep inland, depending on the category, and we just went through a category five. That means all of that area could have been inundated. And we can map it. This is what would happen if you had four feet of rise on the city of Naples. This is Naples six feet of rise, a little bit less than two meters. 60% of the land is underwater because this place is only one meter above sea level. How many meters is Doha above sea level? What's the topography of Doha? I'm sure that you at the university will be doing a wonderful study, but I say to you, dearest James and Schumann, as you go through this study, please don't just study the past. Bring it to the past and how, how, what good is it to protect old buildings when they're gonna be flooded out? if you don't care for that aspect as well. So as I end, I want you to know this is work related to NOAA, to Climate Central, to IPCC, to the great conservancies that do work here. We do not yet know the impact of what's happening in the Antarctic. The best readings we have is in Nature Magazine by DeCanto and Pollard and in science in 2015 by Dutton. IPCC AR assessment report five came back in 2013. The next one will be around 2021. That's the time they think that the science will be adequate to say what the impact of this can be. I wanna to say to you, at the University of Miami, leading scientists are already saying, gentlemen, you are so far off in your conservative estimates, the amount of sea rise in South Florida can be 20 feet. Please remember that we go through cycles. We go through cycles in which 
the whole earth had been pervasively flooded. And this area, we know from archaeology of the flooding that has occurred here, where did Noah's Ark come from? It came from here. So I end by saying, here's work of your friends being done. This was the gang that we got together who's working now. These are the county commissioners of this area. These are the mayors of this area. And on the right is Nadir and his wife. So I ask you, wouldn't it be beneficial if we collaborated? Thank you. Thank you, Nado. Uh, I hope you didn't get that much scared with the last slides, but I think we have to be very cautious and aware of what's happening with the CLA. Thank you, Nado. I would like to welcome now uh, Robert Carter from UCL Qatar. He will be talking about uh, the work done uh, as part of the project, The Origins of Doha, recording the vernacular architecture of Doha. Okay. Thank you, Fodel. Uh, actually, I'm going to be part of a double act. Um, I'm going to start, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Daniel Ed Edisford, who will uh, give the detail of the presentation. So, okay, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk quite briefly about the architectural work that uh, my project has been doing uh, here in Doha and Qatar. Uh, we have a multidisciplinary project that combines archaeology, uh, history, uh, architectural studies, and uh, urban studies, if you like, uh, to look at the history and development of urbanism within Qatar, uh, starting with Doha. Um, we also have a comparative element. Uh, it's great to see uh, what Nadar has been doing around the Gulf. Uh, we're doing some fairly similar things with some of the other Gulf towns, uh, hopefully not duplicating it too much. Uh, but we started with Doha, uh, and we started with an intention to excavate there. There's, I am an archaeologist, um, but this is a multidisciplinary project. Um, as we uh, waited for permission to excavate, we started to uh, record the vernacular architecture of Doha uh, in quite some detail. Uh, and we've also been trying to add the human dimension by talking to the people who lived in some of these districts. Uh, what we're going to show you today really is just a little bit of the architectural work that we've been doing. Um, I should also say that this project is funded by the Qatar National Research Fund. It's, it's a the QF's uh, international grant funding body. Um, so, uh, Really, um, as we started working on the architecture, um, I'm not an architect. Uh, I had to start thinking about uh, why it was relevant and interesting. And it is, of course, uh, the built environment uh, in which people lived and which people created. There's the reflexive uh, relationship between people and their homes. Uh, and this is a vernacular architecture tradition. People built their own homes. Uh, some of the larger, more prestigious elite buildings uh, were built by, uh, if you like, professional builders. I wouldn't say architects. Uh, but in most cases, it was a group effort embedded in the social matrix where people were living. So the people of the district, of the Farij, will get together and they would help each other build their mosque, build their homes, and so on and so forth. Uh, they would provide labor to each other. Uh, in fact, uh, you could build one of these uh, vernacular buildings uh, really quite quickly. Uh, most of these domestic structures were not particularly large and not particularly complex. And if you needed to build a new home, you could do it in a few days with help. And you could get the material locally. You could get all of the materials locally except for the roofing, which of course had to come from further afield and get bought. Uh, for this reason, uh, the townspeople were very mobile. Uh, they were able to be mobile when they had to be. They moved a lot. They could found a new town and build it very, very quickly indeed, from, largely from mo local materials. Very often they would take the wood from their previous homes, the roofs and the doors and the windows, if they had windows, uh, and that would, all, that would be all they would need to take in order to build a new town or a new village elsewhere in really a very short time. Um, so... Up until the 50s and 60s, this way of building was still actually very current. Um, and in fact, uh, as we shall see, much of the surviving vernacular architecture of Doha does belong to the 1950s and 60s. 
And we were trying to not only find out how people created and lived in this, uh, but also just to get a record of it because it, as it was falling down. So as you will see, some of the photos that my team took, um, really, in fact, most of them probably, um, take the form of pictures of collapsed buildings. Uh, we've got an archive of thousands of pictures of bits of buildings that were there previously, as well as the ones which were uh, uh, in more complete form. Uh, the one in the middle is quite well known. Uh, it's, it's featured, in fact, it features in Ibrahim Jada's book, uh, The Mandali House. It's rather nice. We have many more pictures of it. And you'll see, of course, that like many of these buildings, it has been occupied since the 19, probably not since the 1970s, uh, by multiple uh, uh, laborers, effectively, who have used it as their home. Uh, and in fact, it is them who we should credit for keeping these buildings still standing, because they keep them alive. They keep the walls standing, they keep the roofs intact, more or less intact. Once the roof goes, the whole thing collapses. Uh, we also recorded some very humble dwellings, a nice one on the bottom left in old al Ghanim area. That's beautifully preserved and beautifully looked after. And that is a very vernacular building. This is not a nice posh courtyard house. This is a little box. And this is what most people lived in. Uh, the top right, we have uh, uh, what we think is a hunting lodge. It basically looks like a majlis, but it's in a big agricultural area. And it has a bath in it, like a big bath, uh, which you don't normally get in a majlis. So we think it's a hunting lodge. I mean, a bath that you get several men in, um, presumably just men. And here's another example from, uh, uh, I think that's uh, Alasmach on the bottom right. Uh, Dan might be able to correct me if I'm wrong. So that's just to give you an idea of what we were doing. We were going around. Very often we could only record the outsides. Um, sometimes we were able to get inside, and you will see some case studies that Dan will present uh, after I finish my introduction. Now, I was very pleased uh, that Nada talked about the very ancient history of architecture in the region. So I threw together some pictures of courtyard houses going back to about 3,400 BC. That's the earliest one I could find. It's actually North Syria. Um, and then there's some better known ones uh, from Iraq from the third millennium, uh, the one from Ur that he showed from 1800 BC. And in fact, you can trace it through to Saraf on the Iranian coast in the ninth century. And we have very similar architecture in Zabara here in northern Qatar in the 18th century. And of course, we have the late examples from Doha, in this case, uh, not the final manifestations, uh, but one from 1935. And they were still building these into the 50s and 60s. Now, what I'd like to say is this clearly has a very ancient tradition, and it's not restricted only to the Gulf. Uh, what's more, we should not assume that everybody lived in these buildings. This was a minority house, the courtyard house. Most people lived in a little box with a wall around to make the courtyard. They did not have buildings around all of the four sides of their courtyard dwelling. Uh, and in fact, the box was not so much a house, but a multi-purpose area where you would shelter in the, uh, 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 um, you know, when you needed to from bad weather. And then during hot weather, most of the life can actually took place in the courtyard and on the roof. You just stored stuff in your little box. There wouldn't be a separate bathroom. There wouldn't be a separate kitchen. You would just have your single rectangular uh, multi-purpose uh, family room effectively. Of course, that's how it would start, but then as you got a bit more money, uh, you might start adding uh, uh, further units around the building. Um, I also uh, put in some pictures of mosques as well. Now, the simplest kind of mosque that you get also has a very ancient tradition. The bottom two here are village mosques from Qatar built in the uh, uh, 20th century, and the one just above is a mosque from Saraf from the 9th century, a thousand years older, more than a thousand years older. So we do have very uh, deep roots for some of these vernacular traditions. This, of course, is only the ground plan. Here we cannot necessarily uh, relate the decorative elements um, on the upper stories if they existed um, using just the ground plan. Uh, but it's safe to assume that the decorative elements and the use of molded plaster, for example, also go back a very long time. In fact, we have good archaeological evidence for that. Um, so, uh, we're trying to record this vernacular architecture, um, and of course, we use maps a, a great deal, and aerial photos. Uh, the detailed maps of Doha, and in fact, most of the Gulf towns, do not appear until the 1950s. 
when hunting surveys started using aerial imagery to produce detailed street and house maps. Those were extremely useful. In fact, we have, for about 20 years before that, we have a patchy record from aerial photos. This is one of the earliest ones from 1934, uh, looking westwards from the edge of what was then Farij Khalifat uh, towards the old palace and Salata and Hitmi uh, on that peninsula. These are very useful. Uh, so, for example, we know um, that that Farij did not exist in about 1907. Uh, the Khalifi family, the tribe, was then living in Wakra, uh, and this district is not mentioned. And then we have the photograph from 1934, so we know that district was created sometime between 1907-ish and 1934. This helps us build a historical geography of the town. Uh, the 1947 aerial image is quite well known. Uh, the right-hand uh, side of it is missing from most archives, but we can add to it with 1948. Uh, there you see that. And on the right, you see how Doha grew from that stasis point, if you like, in the 1940s, when the town actually stopped growing uh, because the economy had collapsed with the collapse of the pearl fishery. And when we get to 1959, we see the new suburbs which have grown up since the late 1940s, which is entirely underneath uh, the... Um, uh, the impetus of oil revenues. And what we find, actually, is that where we find areas of vernacular architecture, clusters that still survive, they're all in these 1950s growth areas. So the traditional architecture that you find in Doha is not earlier than the 1950s, except for one or two isolated buildings which have been more or less completely reconstructed. So, for example, we worked, we did archaeological excavations in the Redwani House, uh, in what is now known as Mesherib, but previously was not uh, referred to as Mesherib. Uh, this was uh, built probably in the 19, around about 1935, um, and we found older remains beneath it. Uh, but in fact, the only reason it's still there is because it was reconstructed very uh, uh, comprehensively. And it's more or less on its own. It has one or two other houses in the district which are also reconstructed. But this is not a cluster of uh, vernacular architecture still standing in the way that we would understand it, for example, as conservation architects. Instead, you have to go to these districts, Al-Asmach, Najada, Old al Ghanim, and Hitmi, where you can see the last gasp, if you like, of vernacular architecture created by Qataris according to their traditional form. Now, I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to let Dan actually give you some examples where we will see one or two, uh, well, a nice courtyard house and a couple of other examples of the kind of buildings that were built at this time. So, there you go. Thank you, Rob. So, yeah, my name is uh, Dan Edisford. I'm an archaeologist. Uh, I've been uh, working in Qatar since about 2009, uh, during which time I conducted the, some survey and, and, and worked, involved some excavations in the north of the country. And since 2012, I've been working with Rob on the Origins of Doha project, alongside the excavations conducting this uh, mapping. Um, so for me, the division between archaeology and built heritage is fairly vague. In our trenches, we excavate houses that are built in the same way or a similar date to the ones that we are recording as, as standing architecture here. Um, so there's a very um, archaeological approach to the building recording. Um, we focused, as Robert said, on the non-elite vernacular architecture and recording the sequence of changes that the building has undertaken through time and how this material evidence reflects larger cultural and social economic changes uh, in Qatar. Um, seen the kind of urban scale of recording and some of those aerial images Rob was just uh, showing you. Zooming in a little bit, we're moving on to this neighborhood mapping. Uh, which was taken, uh, it's sort of undertaken alongside the Qatar Museum's uh, old Doha mapping project. And the aim was to produce baseline data for various neighborhoods uh, within Doha using aerial imagery. Uh, you can see at the top of this slide to identify individual housing plots. And then going around using uh, digital photography and, and pro forma sheets to record mostly from the street, just from the outside, to get an idea of the types of buildings that are the present, what types of building material are being used, and, and the architectural forms that are surviving in these neighborhoods. Uh, and these streetscapes you know, are, are some of the very few last examples that are surviving in the city.
And then zooming in again, in uh, several of these buildings, we were able to do more detailed recording. So going into the buildings, recording elevations uh, and, and floor plans of these buildings. Uh, the work was fairly opportunistic, so we were going into buildings that we had access to, buildings often that were abandoned and, and threatened with demolition. Uh, not necessarily very high status buildings, and uh, not necessarily buildings that people were interested in recording or even pres uh, preserving. Again, we focused throughout, we're not just recording the original floor plan or the original appearance of these buildings, but recording all the later additions, the doors that are blocked in, the holes that are made for the air conditioning, to understand the full life history of the building and how it, you know, it, it is altered through time. And Gizem is going to present, I think, some of her work on this as well later in the conference. And then the third uh, category of recording focused on agricultural sites. And so this is incorporating aspects of landscape survey and also aspects of building recording uh, to record these agricultural features, these wells, these irrigation features, uh, the majlis like building that Rob just showed us with the bath in it. Um, but again, focusing on the additions that are happening as the hydrocarbon carbon economy comes into play uh, and mechanization becomes important to the well houses and, and, and the pump houses that go with these sites. And oh yeah, so uh, mo most of our recording is quite traditional. It's um, hand-drawn hand records, handwritten records, but also beginning to uh, all use digital technologies, uh, using Google SketchUp to help us reconstruct, to help us imagine these buildings. Uh, using photogrammetry, uh, using rectified photography to produce digital uh, images and, and uh, records of these buildings also. We're just quickly going to see a few of the buildings we recorded in more detail. The Radwani House, as Rob mentioned, is in the now in the Mesheri, um redevelopment. In the top left, you can see the building, we just about see the building in the middle of that photograph in the, about the 1940s, 1947, I believe. It was extensively reconstructed in about 2007, um, and then again as part of the uh, Mesherib redevelopment. So in the top center there, this is what it looks like today, although a lot of that is actually uh, built of concrete, and, and, and it is a very modern reimagining of the building. Um, through our archaeological excavations on the site, we really began to understand the building better and how different compounds were joined together to form its, uh, its uh, current layout um, it's sometime in the 1940s, probably. Uh, a much more humble dwelling, uh, known as the Gypsum House, because of its, uh, its later use as a gypsum manufacturing area. And um, again, uh, a fairly traditional layout around a central courtyard with a smaller courtyard off on the eastern side. But uh, a much, much more humble dwelling. Uh, again, with these alterations as the, uh, the these colonnaded uh, Liwan is, is filled in and the, the building is subdivided uh, into smaller properties. Um, and then also outside of Doha, we've also been working up in Fawaiwat, conducting our close excavations, um, but also mapping the, uh, the latest settlement or latest historic settlement at Fawaiwat. Um, which dates to the, the 1930s, 1940s, um, again, tied into the oil economy. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the mosque in the bottom left, the uh, school block uh, at the, in the top left, um, the a traditional sort of a courtyard house at the top right with these interesting uh, lintel doorways. Yeah, my final slide, the, the, the final bit of the project really is um, what we're doing with all this data, how, how we're using this information, how we're sharing it. So both in academic presentations such as we are talking today, uh, but also this work, um, for example, that Colleen Morgan has been doing uh, at the top left where we are overlaying the historic or the, the, old, the older photos of Doha. I think this is actually... Um, some archaeologists, some Danish archaeologists in the 1950s walking along the edge of Sukhwakif and then it is exactly the same location as it is today or was a couple of years ago. 
Um, at the top right, we have this online GIS um, site, the uh, Doha Online Historic Atlas, which allows us to uh, overlay these layers of information and allows people to interrogate it and, and then also feed back into it to, to give us uh, their thoughts, their stories, their photographs of these areas and actually geolocate that information back into our archive and that's something that might be quite interesting as this project develops. Um, we have a web presence, we have a, uh, various web presences where we are sharing these photos and just very quickly finally, the, I mean, the, one of the other very successful bits of outreach we're doing is going into schools um, and uh, using this information we're gathering and some of these images we're gathering about historic buildings and uh, working with the children, working and helping educate and, and, and help them engage with, uh, with, with these, these aspects of their past. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, uh, Rob. I would like to, you can stay here, would like to call our uh, speakers, panelists, Rob, Shoman, Nader, just join me here and I, I think we can open the floor for about 15 minutes, discussion, questions, five minutes only? Okay, James is saying five minutes. So, any questions please? Yes, Aisha. Uh, my question is for Dr. Nader. Quoting you here when you said uh, the uh, mic, yeah, please. Okay, I'm quoting you here when you said uh, culture is not sociology, or sociology is not culture. What is culture? Yeah, uh, in your point of view, what is culture, and can it be measured? And uh, what would be the measurement tool for culture? Oh, I love it. You've asked what is culture and can it be measured? Is that right? Yes. Oh, what a beautiful question. UNESCO has two conventions about culture. It has the cultural convention of the tangible culture, measurable. And it has a convention of intangible culture, non-measurable. Non-measurable deals with the stories we tell of, to your children and that you inherited from your mother and father and from our grandfathers. It is the story of our life in Qatar or Iran or Verlan, yeah? So you can measure it by recording the story but you can't put a value on it. And today's life, we measure everything by the dollar. If you can't put a dollar value, then it doesn't exist unless you change your unit of measure. So I say to you that we live in a paradox condition. We haven't necessarily regarded these aspects that are intangible in ways, but I believe they are, they are in our poetry, they are in our paintings, they are in our dress, they are in the homes we build. And I try to show you about the courtyard house. Our culture deals with Batan Zahir. This is a key to us. It also deals with the aspect of Fano Baga, of death and real life. These are aspects that are intrinsic to the culture that we are. We're moving into another culture, and yet we don't know a philosophy of how to integrate our traditional culture with 21st century culture. So we are people without knowledge of what worldview we believe in. This is, I believe, who we are today. We don't know what we believe in. In general, you may know, I don't know. But that's my funny answer to you, I apologize. But I think it's a deep thing. You measure it there through your symbols, through the symbols. That's one measure. And as the architects will tell you, Islamic architecture has geometry as one of its p 
pure, important symbols. Why? Because we use Pythagorean geometry, regular geometry, everything that can fit perfectly in a circle. Why? Because a circle has a center, and that center is the unity within the diversity. We believe in unity in the world. These are aspects of geometry. Mathematics also has it. We human beings are mathematically proportioned. If you take your hand, the measure of one index to the other, to the hand, to the arm, are all based on Fibonacci scale, harmonic scale of golden mean. These are all aspects of our culture. When we lose that dimension, we forget our culture and we use other measures to measure culture. Im imperfect answer, sorry. Thank you, Nada. One more question, please. So, Sorry, do you hear me? Yes, okay. Yes, uh, just a, a complementary addition to the culture. It's also related to a social group or one, normally we associate culture to one uh, entity, one society or one social group. So they are not one culture, but there are many cultures. And that makes it valuable also. It's the richness and the variety of the cultures. Um, but coming back to the presentations in general, I was going to it comes to my mind that there is a lot of research that has been done. I'm talking about Doha and Qatar in general for the, on the traditional architectures and the techniques as well and in social environment and so on. And my question was whether there was already, or if there had been before, a comprehensive approach towards the inventory of the heritage in Doha and in Qatar in general. And when I'm talking about inventory, it would mean both on the tangible aspects, but also intangible, meaning uh, as well the buildings, the spaces, and inner and out, but also the uh, know-how associated with these uh, buildings and the uh, traditions and fabrics. So Thank you. Um, the, the answer is there is no comprehensive inventory, but there are some quite detailed separate inventories. So Qatar Museums, um, has uh, a, an online database um, which records the heritage buildings such as they're aware of, uh, but I think not completely comprehensively. Um, we've seen that there's a database at Qatar University as well. Um, the Sherib have a lot of data in addition. Um, and hopefully the, the, one of the outcomes of this meeting will be the beginnings of finding a way of bringing this information together. Um, there are a lot of stakeholders involved, a lot of chunks, if you like, of data. As for integrating things like architectural and, if you like, site-related data with um, anthropological data, oral histories and that, that's another and more complicated um, aspect. Again, there are different archives owned by different groups, different people, different organizations. So uh, that would be... Uh, if you like, a, a second stage, I would have thought at best. Um, and I don't want to speak on behalf of uh, Shulman's intentions. Just, just on, on that, uh, yes, you actually answered very well uh, in the sense that I was going to say that the project that you presented is uh, could, could be it's a good base for this uh, comprehensive approach. Uh, I don't know if uh, it's an associated uh, question to, the, to your answer, whether the Ministry of Culture is implied in this process, uh, or if it should be. You, you know, uh, we can't hear the question very well, or at least I can't. But I go back to what I thought you, the first part of your question dealt with. We have many societies, they may have different cultures. That was one of your first questions, is it? May I go back to that? Certainly today, when we are looking at the cosmopolitan societies that we now are living in, where a very minor percentage of the cosmopolitan population of Doha 
have a Muslim belief system and the majority are from other societies, that's a real issue. But you know, we're societies in construction. At a certain point, this construction lessens, the number of expatriates lessens, and you begin to also look at what you've built and you begin to make decisions about who are we, is this really what we want to be built? So you'll then begin to really be able to answer what in the 21st century is, ma is a cosmopolitan cultural answer. We're not working on that. We, we avoid that question. We build this culture in glass and it's 30 stories tall and it's invested in by the world and we flip it. We don't care. You build it and you sell it. It's, not, it's a throwaway. Somebody else's responsibility, okay? But what happens is after a while, you then settle down to your own society and you don't go through this pace that all of our societies are going through because you can't keep this pace going. This pace is aberration. So let's look at the time when aberration goes and you're living a more normal life. In that life, you have to begin to answer what is the philosophy of integrating our traditional core views, what I call perennial views. You know, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about spirituality. What do you believe about the world as a core view? And I think that in these cultures, there are core views that we really do share. We build the same courtyard house. We believe in Batin Zahir. You know, I'm just examples. Okay, after a while, we have to take these and then begin to integrate it into 20th century scientific sense of life modified by the fact that it's not giving us the full answer. I think that's the paradox in which we live in today. Uh, I think one more addition probably from Shoman regarding the large project to answer. Well, uh, just a very quick one. Yes, I think uh, I share the concerns regarding having a comprehensive database and a comprehensive uh, information system that uh, hopefully will uh, build on Nader's fantastic, uh, Nader and the, and the uh, GSD's fantastic uh, work, uh, which has already been done. Um, and I think we have to find also ways in which one can incorporate the less tangible, less measurable aspects, which is um, a constant challenge for all of us because not, not everything can be measured, and not everything, in fact, should be measured, but has to be understood and uh, assessed. And there's, there are other methods of analyzing that. Um, there are methods that cultural historians, cultural uh, specialists have used for many, many, many years. And I think it also has to be included in terms of understanding other special qualities, and that is cannot be enumerated, if you like. So I think we have to have other methods and measures you know, put in place other than just the sheer enumeration to make sure that there is a basis for a comprehensive data collection. At the end of the day, what we want is a more complete view as far as is feasible uh, on that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in thanking our panelists for a really fantastic presentation. This gives you an illustration of what is possible how many stories you can tell through architecture and how far it can take us in understanding ourselves and our future as well as the present. From something as core as one's identity, who you are, to where you will be in future. So as you can see, these are, this is just one taste of many of the different aspects uh, of, of, of the world around us uh, that the Gutter National Library intends to, to bring to you. Uh, through our research projects. Uh, it is now my pleasure to uh, tell you you have an hour for lunch, and at uh, 2.15, please be back here for part two of our continuing look at existing research projects on traditional architecture. Thank you very much.